So episode one, we really focused on the Y Extreme Fabric Connect, um, which I think really sets the foundations um, of the rest of the series, to be honest. So what have we got coming up in episode two? Episode two starts off with Dijkstra. Dijkstra, uh, uh, Dutch mathematician, he kind of sets the stage for everything that happens in Fabric Connect. So we're going to start with that, and then we're going to get into the, the, the technical details of building a network using Fabric. Really, really interesting. I think people will enjoy this episode because on top of this, we're going to layer everything else. Very good. Ready to go? Let's hit the studio. Let's do it. The idea over here is to eliminate some of the complexities of networking and, and things that can lead to a network being absolutely crippled, like loops. Broadcast storms on a network can absolutely paralyze your network. Of course, by using protocols like uh, spanning tree protocol, you can eliminate those loops, but you take a hit in terms of performance and bandwidth, having to close and shut off certain ports. So IEEE approach this problem with shortest path bridging. You can't really talk about shortest path bridging without talking about Edgar Dijkstra. Dijkstra creates an algorithm with the objective of being able to find the most efficient path between two points. We use it nowadays as GPS. Dijkstra's theorem underpins GPS. We want to go from location A to location B in the fastest or shortest time possible. So not only is it useful for GPS, but it has been adopted into networking, into routing as well. So let me show you how Dijkstra's algorithm works graphically. Okay, so for the purposes of this illustration, we're gonna draw out seven points on the screen. You could call them vertices in geometry, a vertice is a point where two or more curves, line or edges meet. So if you think of a university campus, quite a large area, these could represent seven different buildings. Let's give them labels. So we'll start here and we'll give this an A. And I'm not going to do this alphabetically. I'll just randomly choose letters and we'll fill that in in that way. So like any trip that you would do, in a vehicle, you want to have a starting point and you want to have an end point. And you want to know what is the shortest point? How do you do this mathematically? So in this case, we're going to go from A and we want to end up at Z. Z or Z is our destination. If this was a network, we would be connected. So the buildings would be connected. So let's connect them all using these straight lines like this. So now I have a network that's completely connected and they could be fiber connections, it could be whatever, depending on the distance between these points or these buildings. Now, like we said, we want to go from A to Z, what's the shortest path? Well, to know that, we would need to have some costs between these different buildings. Now, I'm going to use arbitrary numbers over here. They don't represent anything for the purposes of this illustration. So a network engineer would say, okay, either those I'm going to put in costs and they could represent actual distance. They might represent that 100 meters or 200 meters from building A is building B or, or building B lab. But they could also be other things. They could be the amount of bandwidth. So for example, you might say, well, between building J and building E, I have massive amount of bandwidth. I have an 80 gigabit connection. So that means I have tons of bandwidth. I'm going to give it a really low cost. I'm going to give it a cost of one. But between E and P, well, I don't have a very fast network connection. And maybe between A and J, it's, it's even slower than that. So I'll give it a cost of 14. The important thing to realize is this is just arbitrary numbers. Now, while I've been talking, you've been looking at that screen and you've already started working out in your head what is the shortest path from A to Z. And you might think, ah, it must be this one here because A to J is 14 and 2 and 3. Well, if I do that calculation, that comes out at 19. So maybe that's the shortest route. And then you started calculating other routes and you said, okay, well, maybe it could be this one because that is three plus five 
plus 9, and that is how much? It's 17. Oh, so this one is cheaper than that one. So, yeah, this one is the root. But is that the cheapest? If I just leave it like this on screen for another minute or two, you might definitely find other roots, some more expensive, some cheaper, to get you from A to Z. But what if you had hundreds of thousands of points? You couldn't do that in your head. That's why we need Dijkstra. That's why we need these algorithms so that we can calculate this. And network engineers are interested in this because this is what Fabric Connect is going to use to calculate the shortest path between nodes on our Fabric Connect network. To complete all of this, we're going to have to put in a table just to track all of these things because we now need to take Dijkstra's algorithm to put it into this diagram, run it as a constant repeat until we've gone to every point and calculated what's the cheapest to the next point from where I am. Let's start with the first, the first step. We're at A. How much does it cost to get to A? Well, it doesn't cost anything. We are already on A. So in the table, the shortest distance from A Let's fill that in as a zero. Then the algorithm says visit the unvisited vertex with the smallest known cost from the start vertex. You'll see that there's no costs on all these other vertices, but mathematically what we really should do is put infinity symbols over here because we don't know cost. Yes, visually you can look and see, but mathematically to symbolize that we don't know the costs, we put an infinity symbol. So we've been to A, let's just cross out A. We can't use that again in a calculation because we've, we've now done that. Let's look at the unvisited vertices with the smallest known cost from the start. So what are the vertices connected to A? Well, they are J, they are E, and they are K. Those are the three that are connected to A. Why not P? Well, if you look at the map, you can see over here that P has no direct connection to A. It goes through another vertice. It goes through J. So only J, E, and K. Okay. Now that we've identified them, the next step in the algorithm says for the current vertex, calculate the cost of each neighbor from the start vertex. This is important from the start. So we know that A has a cost of zero. Okay, so how do we calculate what J is? It is zero plus 14, which is equal to 14. What about E? Well, that's quite easy. It's zero plus six, which is equal to six, of course. And then it is K at a cost of three. Perfect. The next step in the algorithm says, if the calculated cost, the cost that you've just worked out of these vertices is less than the known cost, the cost that you already know that's in that table, update it with the cheaper cost. Okay, so let's start with the top one, J. J is 14. Let's see what J currently is on there. Oh, hang on, it's infinity, infinitely high. So let's remove that. And let's put in there 14. It is 14. Why? Because 14 is less than infinity. Perfect. What about E? Well, E has a cost of 6. What was it previously? E was a cost of infinity. All right. So now it is a, has a cost of 6. Perfect. And the next one is K. K. K has also a cost of infinity and we're gonna ch change that to a cost of three. The next step now says, update the prev previous vertex column for each of the updated costs. So the previous vertex, J, to get to J, where did we come from? Well, we actually came from A. So there, we update the vertex in K. Where did, how did we get to K? Well, we came from A. And how did we get to E? Well, it came from A. Perfect, we've now got that done. At this point, I have a challenge for you. Pause the video and record the path you think is the shortest path from A to Z. So now that you've written down your answer, the algorithmic steps that you've just seen are repeated various times until there are no more unvisited vertices. At that point, the shortest path from A to Z is revealed. I'm not gonna show the entire thing on screen, 
as it takes up quite a bit of time. So as an alternative, a QR code as well as a URL are gonna pop up on screen. If you follow the QR code or the URL, it'll take you to the full video showing the entire algorithm being played out. Go and check to see if you got it right. You might get an exam question on this. One of the challenges we face when teaching Extreme Fabric Connect is the sheer amount of acronyms and abbreviations that we need to deal with. So what we're gonna do to try and make this easier is, I'm going to deal with all these abbreviations, with all these acronyms up front, explain them, unpack them a little bit. And so when we get to the next section, you as a viewer will already be familiar with what we are talking about. And these, and these terms will not be completely new to you. VSN, Virtual Services Network. So we have a physical infrastructure, which means physical cables plugged into physical switches. And on top of that, Fabric Connect is gonna give us virtual services networks. Think of it kind of like a VLAN. It is a network on top of a network. If you have a network of switches, on the edge of your network is where your users are going to connect into that Fabric Connect. That interface coming from the outside or coming from a user into your Fabric Connect, that's called the user to network interface. For example, if you're an ISP, it would be connected to a customer's VLAN and it could be untagged or it could be Q-tagged. And then you get a network to network interface. This is known as an NNI, network to network interface. Switches on your edge and you have a switch in the middle, in your core. If that switch is connected to each one on the end, those are NNI, network to network interfaces. The next one is called a BCB, backbone core bridge. So I said to you, if you have switches on the edge of your network, you might also have switches in the center, in the core of your network. You don't have to, but generally that's the accepted practice. Those switches in the core, they are referred to as BCB. Are these switches different from each other? If you were buying a Fabric Connect network, do you buy BCB switches? And do you buy other type? What type of switches do you buy? Well, the interesting thing is, Extreme Networks has a whole new range of switches called universal switches. And they're simple switches that when you power them up, you can choose the personality that you prefer to have running on the switches. And if you f prefer Fabric Connect, they will then function as Fabric Connect switches. The, what makes it the BCB, the backbone core bridge, is simply how you connect the cables into it and from where. A BCB bridge switch doesn't connect to any users on the network. The edge switches connect to the users. Internally, that switch connects to others. That's why it's called a BCB. It's not a different SKU. It's not a different piece of hardware. It is exactly the same hardware as all the other switches on your network. The edge switches that I've been referring to, they are called BEBs, BEBs. So the BCB was in the core and the BEB is where? You guessed it, on the edge, backbone, edge, bridge. It is a switch that sits on the edge of the network. When we say it sits on the edge, it talks directly to customers, to consumers. Even though this terminology is talking about two different concepts, BCB, BEB, physically, it's exactly the same type of hardware. So what exactly is a SPB network, a Fabric Connect network? It's completely based on open standards. There's no proprietary lock-in on a Fabric Connect switch. You can even connect other devices that are nothing to do with Extreme. You can connect access points, you can connect other switches from other vendors into Fabric Connect. It eliminates the need to implement spanning tree in the Fabric core. It provides this loop prevention and suppression through reverse path forwarding check, another mechanism to guarantee absolutely no loop. If you have two paths and they are the same cost, 
it doesn't die because it doesn't know what to do. It can support both of those uh, both of those costs as well. Feature that people are gonna absolutely love about this is the convergence time. So when you add another switch into the network, ISIS automatically builds a topology map of that entire network within that switch. And if you need to tear down a switch, if you need to eliminate a switch from that network, it automatically recalculates. There's a convergence. If a switch goes down, there's a convergence in the time of less than 200 milliseconds. Imagine that, less than 200 milliseconds and a, a network, a fabric connected network, with say thousands of switches within 200 milliseconds, that whole network has been reconfigured absolutely instant. As we've said before, it supports any network topology. You don't have to reconfigure your network and the way you've designed your network because Fabric Connect only accepts one particular design. Bring your design, bring the complexity, bring it into Fabric Connect and it just works brilliantly. It's also extremely powerful when it comes to multicast because it uses the same routes for both unicast and multicast. So it's a known route. It's so easy. You set it up and immediately it's available across your entire Fabric Connect network. You have the ability to provide layer two and layer three virtual services on your network, there's no work that you as a network administrator have to do. It's automatically done within this Fabric Connect technology. I mean, how good is that? Absolutely instant. So what's the takeaway from this episode? What one thing can you tell somebody if they ask you, what is Fabric Connect? Well, tell them that Fabric Connect is not some airy fairy networking technology built on proprietary standard. It means that it's built on standards developed by the IEEE. There's nothing proprietary that's going to lock you into this technology. Go with the Fabric Connect network. You can still use your existing access points and other switches. They all work harmoniously because of IEEE standard. That's the takeaway line. We've covered a lot of stuff today and there were a lot of acronyms. VSN, UNI, SPB, SPBN, VLAN, NNI, BCB, BVLAN, CVLAN, BEB. Whoa, did you get that? See you in episode three.